The Porsche 911 is one of the best engineered cars in the world, except it has one fatal aerodynamic flaw, it's shaped like a wing. So it naturally produces lift, which makes it unstable at high speeds and leads to crashes. To overcome this problem, Porsche put a rear wing on it. That's fine, except rear wings produce a lot of drag for the amount of downforce you get. It's very inefficient. And there's actually a much simpler way to reduce the 911's lift and without additional drag. In fact, it can also reduce the car's drag too. But first, I want to address a common comment we get. We often talk about how with many cars, the front lip is very sharp and that creates flow separation and increased drag. The common comment we get is that that's because we don't model the cooling flow, so there is more air having to be redirected around it. Well, to show you that it doesn't matter, we simulated the 911 with a completely open front grille and radiator. You can see that there is still horrendous flow separation around the front lip. Now that that's out of the way, let's get into how you can solve the 911's lift problem without increasing its drag. To show it, we simulated the 2021 911 Targa version, which is the best version because it is convertible. The front grille and radiator are open, the side cooling flows aren't because this is being simulated at 70 km per hour, and apparently, from Porsche's website, these vents will be closed at this speed, unless it's open, and then it would be open, so it is closed here. Now, this charged cooling flow is actually Porsche making lemonade out of lemons, because without the rear wing, you wouldn't get that high pressure flow being pushed in, but that still means you have the drag penalty. At this speed, the rear wing is also retracted, which makes it more eco. Anyway, moving on to the aerodynamics of this base version. It's really good to begin with, I mean, yes, we did see that the front lip is still bad, like most cars, but after that, the rest of the underbody is really nice. It is accompanied by quite low pressure, which helps overcome the inherent problem with the Porsche design. One thing that I am a little surprised at is just how gentle the diffuser is. As it stands, there isn't too much low pressure there. I mean, if they made it more angled, they could probably get rid of that lift problem right there. But that's not actually the solution we're going through today. Anyway, the hood is fantastic. This is one region that the Porsche really excels at because you can see just how little the air's velocity changes as you go along it. That results in the naturally occurring low pressure there to be minimized, which is good for downforce. Then we get to the problematic windshield and roof region that you can see on many cars. The shallow hood angle coupled with the much more angled windshield means that the flow decelerates a lot. You can really see just how it goes from that orangey to yellow to even green. That tells us that a lot of energy is being dumped into the windshield and you're not gonna get that back. That is a bit of a problem because of the drag it creates, but it isn't as bad as it could be. And what I mean by that is if you look past the roof, you can see just how slow the floor is becoming. That is a really thick boundary layer forming. That is forming for a couple of reasons. Because the roof is very curved, you get increasing pressure the further back you go, and that pushes back on the floor and decelerates it prematurely. But the other reason why the boundary layer is so thick is because of that lost energy from the floor hitting the relatively sharp windshield. Fortunately here, there isn't much danger of flow separation over the rear because you can see that the speed is still like 10 meters per second and higher, and to get flow separation through this geometry, it would need to be close to zero or negative. So you don't get flow separation, but then you also don't get that much energy going into the wake and that increases the drag. Now as for the pressure over the top of the roof and the rear half of the car, we get very low values and that is where the 911's problem arises. I mean, just zooming in and looking at its general geometry, it is flat underneath and very curved on top. It is effectively a cambered wing, and cambered wings produce lift at zero degrees angle attack. So this geometry is really just a highly stylized cambered wing, which makes the car unstable at high speeds. Now that's the bad news. The good news is that because it is effectively a highly stylized wing, the trailing edge, aka the rear of the car, has almost completely attached flow, and that means that the wake is tiny. Like, you would struggle to find any other car with a wake this small. It's phenomenal. That is something that the Porsche is better at than almost any other car. As a result, the drag dropped a lot. And while this vortices orbit might look really bad, most of these vortices are really coming from just the wheels and wheelhouses, and the side mirrors. These vortices occur because the wheelhouses poke out a lot. And the drag orbit shows that so much of the 911's drag is really just from these regions because the wake is so tiny, and minimal drag is being produced, relatively speaking. As a result, the drag coefficient of this car is just a 0.29. That's phenomenal for a supercar. And remember, this is without the rear wing either. So this is more or less the best case scenario. And in this configuration, the lift comes in at 13.2 kilos, which is high, but not surprising because we know that the 911 has a lift problem anyway. Does it even lift, bro? Now that we know what the numbers are, how can you reduce this lift? And without using something like a rear wing, 
which significantly increases the drag. Well, we are going to go back to the basics and take advantage of the Venturi effect. Looking at the underbody, it is really flat and most of the cars are like that. But that is a missed opportunity because you have the road providing one side of the barrier, then the car is the other side of the barrier. So by changing the car's underbody height as you go along, you can change how much the flow needs to speed up. The more it speeds up, the lower the pressure drops, and that provides you with downforce. So to take advantage of that simple idea, you could bow out any section on the underbody, for example like this. This bump is around the diffuser area, which isn't doing too much anyway, but you could move it anywhere you like. The theory is that this will produce a lot of low pressure under it, and wherever you have it, that is where the downforce will be created. So not only can you create more downforce, but you can control where it occurs, and that means you can easily balance the car. In addition to that, because it is curved, there is minimal energy loss, which means almost no drag. And in fact, if you were to put it around the diffuser area, you could potentially reduce the drag because it would simply act like a rounded diffuser. And one thing I want to stress is that this is literally the first iteration of this design. So this isn't one that has been optimized. In fact, that is the case with all the modifications we show in our videos. They're the first try. How they come out is how they come out. So that's the theory behind this design. Does it work? In a word, yes. Comparing the pressures in this side view, there is so much more low pressure underneath it. And one thing to note is that there is a little high pressure ahead of it, and that is because of the junction between the underbody and the bump is not completely blended together. So when the air hits it at the bump, there is a little resistance. If I were to do this design again, I would blend that front junction more to reduce how high pressure there is and produce even more low pressure over the bump. The velocity plot really shows just how much the flow speeds up. You can see how red it gets, and it doesn't mess with the Porsche's incredibly small wake either, so it preserves their great work there. And even with the sides of the car completely open, so the outside flow can enter and neutralize the low pressure, there is still a very strong Venturi effect occurring. You can see in the top view that there isn't too much of a difference between the car without the underbody bump and with it. The drag orbit still shows minimal amounts in the wake, so it hasn't changed that much. In fact, the drag comes in at almost the same value, just four counts higher, which is within the error of the simulation. So this first iteration didn't change the drag. As for the lift, the original car produced 13.2 kilos of lift. With this underbody bump, it has more than halved it to 6.2 kilos. So a 50% reduction with no drag penalty. These simulations were done with OpenFoam, and if you want to learn how to use OpenFoam, then take our course here. Peace out, amigos.